Hello, everyone, and um, I think we'll start now. I think we've, uh, we've waited a few minutes, and I think anyone who's going to join will be able to join in the next um, few minutes, but we can start. So I would like to welcome you all to the second webinar in the GFMD Capacity Building Program. I'm Anne-Marie Hammer, and I'm the Programs and Policy Manager at the Global Forum for Media Development. So the, uh, the Capacity Building Program is the result of consultations with our small and medium-sized members, and they've told us that they need practical skills that can help them to survive and thrive in this very competitive nonprofit environment. So Michael will be speaking on the topic of the challenges to EU funding, which I'm sure is a topic many of us here today are, um, are keen to hear his insights on. He's a media consultant with 20 years of experience in designing, writing, and evaluating proposals, has an exceptional track record of securing funding from all the major donors, as well as European governments and private foundations. And Michael worked for BBC Media Action for 17 years, focusing on areas such as TV co-production, uh, community radio, social media, journalism training, media regulation, media law reform, and public service broadcasting. So we couldn't hope for a more qualified speaker on this topic. Michael, I'm going to hand the webinar over to you now. So thank you and enjoy. So good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, thanks very much indeed for, for, for being here. Uh, and uh, I hope to spend the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour looking at the challenges of uh, accessing EU funding with a particular focus on the current uh, EIDHR global call. Um, I want to avoid reiterating what you can read for yourselves from the uh, documentation that's related to this call or indeed what you know already about EU funding. M my aim is to give you a personal insight uh, into how the system works, uh, how you can make yourselves competitive, uh, how you can respond to this specific call based on a very long experience of, uh, of applying for EU funding. I think I, I wrote my first um, proposal for the EIDHR in 2001, uh, and I've been involved in bids almost annually ever since. Um, you may ask uh, what right a British <laughs> citizen has to comment on EU values and EU policy, but um, I don't... Uh, I don't discount myself from uh, having the right to do that, and um, I, as I say, have a long experience to draw on. Um, the, uh, you, I, I want to un underline two things, one of which is that uh, the remarks I'll make about EAD, EIDHR are very much uh, my interpretation, uh, my view, uh, my opinion. I don't have uh, a back door to the European Commission. I haven't spoken to individuals who will be evaluating this call, um, so I, it's difficult for me to say where their key interests or priorities lie, but I can certainly give you my view on the kind of proposal that they will be looking for um, and how to best present the ideas in a way to uh, make your proposal attractive to them. Uh, I think that uh, we, if we can um, organize a discussion through, uh, through this medium, it will be great. I appreciate that it's challenging, um, especially when there's a large group, uh, but I would like to give you the opportunity to uh, express your opinions where possible. I appreciate that because this is ultimately a competitive program, you're unlikely to be willing to share the ideas that you have uh, and get feedback on them. But in terms of the general themes that I'll be touching on, it would certainly be interesting to, to hear your views uh, and to open that out to, to wider discussion. Um, I am going to base my uh, my talk uh, on, a, on a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but uh, I hope that you know you won't find that too dispiriting, uh, and uh, it will obviously be part of the recording. So the bullet points that are made there will be something that you can take away with you afterwards. So with that, with on that note, I'll open the PowerPoint now.
and go straight into uh, the objectives uh, of today's session, um, which are to uh, share my insights into EU funding in general uh, and this global call in particular. Um, to talk, as I said, about you know, what I feel to be the key ingredients of a competitive proposal, again, with specific reference to this call, but also more generally in terms of the way in which the European Union evaluates projects uh, and makes its, its decisions. Uh, I would like to devote the, the, the majority of the time to looking at the objectives of Lot 3 for the Global Call for 2018 and to present some of the thoughts that I have uh, about what kind of idea would be appealing to the uh, evaluators in this context and to touch on some of the trends and themes that are currently uh, high on um, donors' priorities uh, in this area. In terms of applying for EU funding, many organisations, particularly those that haven't applied before, share concerns um, both about the complexities of managing grants and also the uh, amount of work that one has to put into the application and the chances of success. I'm just going to run quickly through these bullet points because any of you who have worked with the EU will know these already. Uh, those who are new to it may find them enlightening. Uh, I, the, it is a bureaucratic organization. The European Commission and its delegations, they have high levels of bureaucracy and they don't always interpret their rules in the same way, uh, which does make it challenging to, to manage and implement projects. I think the evaluation processes are often politicized. Uh, I think that they're looking for certain organizations to apply at certain times. They're looking for a good spread of countries, of local international uh, applicants. And up until I think relatively recently, there has been a perceived bias towards large EU based organizations. There's a feeling that organizations outside of the EU are disadvantaged when it comes to applying for EU funding, either because they don't have the capacity and skills to put bids together, or because the EU would rather work with organizations that it knows. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, what is for sure is that there are significant risks attached to managing uh, EU grants. There's a high risk of disallowed costs. Uh, this means that when you deliver uh, and you spend money in good faith on the activities that were agreed with the EU, according to the budget that was agreed with the EU, once it comes to audit time, very often organizations find that the, their interpretation of the rules and the EU's interpretation of the rules are very different. Uh, and many large organizations have incurred a very high level of, uh, uh, of costs which have been disallowed. To my knowledge, uh, up to 20 or 30% of costs, which if uh, you're <laughs> reliant on these grants to survive can obviously be devastating. The curve funding requirements is off-putting. Um, they can be up to 20%, and that means finding a significant amount of money from other sources, uh, which uh, can be difficult, especially if the themes or the priorities of this program don't coincide with the priorities of co-funders. Um, there are, in within the budgets, uh, the provision for a relatively low level of overhead, uh, the standard amount, maximum amount of, as you, as you probably know, is 7%. Uh, and some organizations are nervous about putting in significant management costs on top of that. So many organizations find that they're spending more on managing projects than they can recoup from the budget, which is obviously off-putting. Uh, I think, and this is a case in point, uh, that it is sometimes difficult to assess what the priorities of the donor are, what its kind of projects it's really looking for uh, in the context of these very wide ranging global programs. So I hope to be able to cast more light on that later on. Organizations feel that the odds of winning are low. 
uh, there are a huge number of applications uh, and as I say often there's a perception that priority is given to those organizations that have already got a very strong track record of winning and delivering EU projects. For me the biggest frustration is the lead time so it can take six months to a year for uh, the EU to process applications and make a decision by which time some of the issues that were addressed by the project may no longer be as um, important uh, or as pressing as they were before. But on the plus side, the EU is probably the biggest donor for media development projects uh, in um, its core uh, focus uh, areas, regions. Uh, it has a global outreach. Uh, it presents uh, objectives or priorities that offer uh, a lot of room for manoeuvre, a lot of uh, room to present a variety of ideas. For the EIDHR Global Call, what is particularly interesting is that uh, it doesn't require the consent of governments, which is not the case in the majority of EU programmes. So it is possible to go in under the wire and uh, develop projects in uh, highly challenging environments with local operators who are not necessarily uh, formally registered or are working on the fringes of the media sector or the civil society sector. Uh, the EIDHR call, this call has no nationality restrictions, uh, which again makes it unique. So uh, American organizations can apply, uh, organization, any organization outside the EU can apply. Um, there is more flexibility here with eligibility requirements than is usual. So in this particular instance, uh, it's possible to argue the case for uh, commercial organizations to be involved uh, and for organizations that are not necessarily legal entities. So that's uh, uh, very different from uh, the majority of EU programs. Uh, and there is a low co-funding requirement, so one can apply for up to 95% of the uh, eligible costs, and it is also possible to argue the case for 100%. Uh, so obviously that takes away the concern about not being able to cover the shortfall. And in my opinion, putting together a concept note for a, a, an EIDHR call is uh, is not work intensive. Uh, actually writing it up is a relatively swift process. Putting together the idea, negotiating the partnerships, that's what takes time. But uh, I think that uh, the investment uh, in the concept note is usually well worth the effort. I just flagged up these uh, figures just to address uh, uh, the perception I mentioned earlier that the global calls are usually awarded to EU-based organizations. I, uh, Ten years ago that was definitely the case. I think it's become less and less the case as time goes on. So if you look at the results of the 2015 call, uh, which was focused very much on um, human rights uh, defenders, uh, out of the 30 grants awarded, 20 were won by EU-based organizations. But the following year, uh, more grants awarded, and actually the majority were won by applicants from outside the EU. So my personal opinion is that the EU wants to give more and more funding to organizations outside the member states. I often hear from EU managers that they physically can't do it very often because the quality of the proposals they're getting from um, partner countries or from target countries is not high enough. Uh, I, I think also that uh, countries outside the EU find it difficult to, or organizations based in those countries, don't have the track record necessarily to be able to apply for larger grants, which, which puts them on the back foot. But recent statistics show that um, that uh, there is every reason to apply uh, if you're not in, uh, based in an EU member state. I want to do a very quick case study, uh, which uh, is from my own experience. Uh, it was a project financed by the EIDHR 
uh, in Turkmenistan. And I wanted to use it because it illustrates uh, that within this program, there is significant appetite for risk, the significant appetite for working in challenging environments, uh, for uh, pushing back the boundaries. Uh, and Turkmenistan, it frankly doesn't get much more challenging than that. It comes second from the bottom after North Korea in all um, uh, media freedom tables. Uh, it's a totally state controlled media. Uh, the president is uh, the god and uh, tsar of uh, all that he surveys. Uh, this is the country in which human rights and basic freedoms are not respected in any way. Uh, and yet the EIDHR uh, funded a, um, a 1.5 million euro project over three years to work with the uh, Turkmen media. And it was a project I managed. Um, it was uh, negotiated entirely with the government. We had total government approval for everything because if we hadn't, we would never have been able to, to work there. Uh, it uh, worked within very narrow parameters. Um, we were uh, able to bring in international consultants, but uh, only once they had been approved. Uh, and uh, there were many challenges around uh, the, the management of it uh, and the process of negotiation with the stakeholders involved. Um, I think that we'll talk a little bit later on about uh, the principle of do, do no harm, uh, that you shouldn't be operating in environments where uh, you uh, undermine the ability of government to govern or the ability of civil society to support the interests of vulnerable groups or the ability of the media to uh, provide uh, information in an accessible way. Uh, I think that this particular project illustrates that there is do no harm, but there's also the principle of do no good. <laughs> uh, and the ability genuinely to uh, make a significant impact on the media sector in Turkmenistan was almost zero, uh, simply because the uh, challenges were so great. Um, so I respect the European Union for having tried. Um, and for being willing to commit funding to uh, supporting a, a media sector that was desperately in need of uh, support. But the ability to do it was so limited that uh, uh, ultimately the long-term impact uh, is impossible to see. Uh, on the, the, the reason it makes an interesting case study is because uh, it was an example of the EU uh, giving the implementing agency, which was BBC Media Action, enormous freedom to develop the project and to respond and adapt to uh, changing circumstances. So we were able to uh, assess what was possible on a rolling basis, feed that back to the uh, task manager and modify the project to ensure that it continued to do the best it possibly could in that environment. And that's by no means the case, as you almost certainly know, with all of EU funding. Uh, so I was uh, always very uh, aware and, uh, and uh, grateful for uh, the support I got from the, from the Commission uh, and uh, obviously operating in that kind of environment, that support becomes essential because frankly you have no recourse to uh, any other mechanisms in country uh, which are going to provide you with the, um, the political uh, muscle that you need or the political uh, buy-in that you need to, uh, to, to make things happen. A few remarks now about uh, how to make bids competitive. Uh, I would urge anyone applying for EU funding to familiarise themselves with 
the EU interests, uh, the level of EU interest in the country that you're considering uh, for, um, for, for for your project. Uh, I think that uh, the, the the EU has a, a broad global outreach, of course, but clearly there are certain regions and certain countries that uh, have a greater interest, both in uh, political terms uh, and in terms of what the EU can genuinely achieve. Uh, so I think it's important to, uh, when you develop your strategy, to, to look at those aspects of it uh, and to, uh, to, to, to choose both your activities and your geographical focus accordingly. For the EIDHR, I do think it's important to put in a proposal that pushes back the boundaries. As I say, this is the EU programme for daring bids, for taking risks. Uh, I think to come to the EIDHR with a very standard uh, approach uh, that has been um, tried and tested uh, for a long period of time uh, and is effectively more of the same is a mistake. Uh, I think you need to come back uh, with innovation, with new ideas, uh, and there is significant margin for what I would describe as experimentation. Uh, again, I don't think the EIDHR is afraid of things not going according to plan. So to present ideas that uh, are perhaps the first of their kind or um, are exploring new territory is something they will find that they will find appealing provided you can demonstrate uh, a knowledge of uh, the sector the risks involved uh, and the potential rewards and i think more generally when you're putting together proposals it's extremely important to demonstrate a knowledge of the, of the wider development sector that you an understanding of who else is there what they're doing and how your project will either complement those other programs, build on them, or work in collaboration with them. Don't forget that much of the EU's motivation for funding development projects per se is to promote EU values, is to demonstrate that the EU's approach to democracy and human rights is aspirational, that the EU is a crucible for best practice, uh, demonstrating within proposals that you know those values and that you recognize uh, and respect that best practice, I think that's very important. One thing I cannot emphasize enough is the need to tie any idea as closely as possible to the priorities of the program. What I usually do is I, I go into the terms of reference, I cut and paste the uh, priorities and I mark my own idea against them, you know, to the extent to which the idea that I'm trying to present or the objectives that I'm trying to achieve closely reflect uh, what the EU is trying to achieve through the programme. Value for money and return on investment are certainly two issues that are extremely important to the EU uh, and I think need to be uh, emphasized as much as possible within bids and I classic um, approaches that uh, the, the, the the Commission appreciate and favor is anything that can demonstrate uh, a multiplier effect that can demonstrate replication that can demonstrate that by the investment that the EU is making in this country at this time it will have a ripple effect across the wider sector, will be taken up by multiple stakeholders, and of course, ideally, will be sustainable. The practicalities of putting together a competitive bid, um, we've run some previous seminars on this issue. Um, many of these concepts will be familiar to you already. Uh, it's about being concise, it's about being clear, it's about selling the idea. Uh, I think, and we'll talk about this when we, when we look at lot three, uh, the, the issue of target groups and beneficiaries is extremely important. You need to demonstrate that you understand your audience, that you can reach your audience through the intervention, and that you can quantify your audience as far as possible, uh, and that those quantities or those aspirations are realistic. So I think it's all about 
thinking through that uh, whole logical sequence of events from developing skills within your target groups or developing programming within your target groups and ensuring that reaches the widest possible audience uh, within the, the given country. We'll also talk about cross-cutting issues. Uh, all EU programs have cross-cutting issues which are very much the same from one to another. We'll look at the specific ones for this lot in a moment. Uh, the more you can weave those in, the more uh, points you will score. It's as simple as that. I also think it's extremely important to demonstrate that the consortium of organisations you put together for these bids uh, have a, a relationship that's more than just reaching out to them through the internet, you know, a few weeks before the deadline. Uh, of course, not all, all organizations will have had the opportunity to work together uh, before uh, or in the past, but um, in the context of a new project or new proposal, it's important to demonstrate that you have collaborated uh, in developing the idea that you've drawn on each other's experience, each other's resources to come up with an idea that really makes sense. So the more that can be underlined in a proposal or in a concept note, the better. The more you can talk about that dialogue or that sharing of experience um, and uh, ideas, the better. Uh, innovation on added value, these are clear. They, the more you have that in there, the more the IDHR will warm to your idea. Uh, and the sustainability strategy as well uh, is a key element of um, the evaluation procedure. Uh, like all donors, the Commission doesn't want to feel that these projects are a one off flash in the pan, uh, and once they the funding has come to an end, the waters will close over their head. So any elements of it that can be replicated in the longer term are obviously going to uh, score you uh, higher in the evaluation process. The information, I'm just emphasizing it because it's super important in my opinion to link your idea with the rights-based approach uh, and to demonstrate uh, uh, maximum or optimum inclusion. The, in British funding uh, circles, they like to use the expression, leave no one behind. I think that sits at the bottom of this rights-based approach. It's about considering the needs and interests of what they call the rights holders, so the ultimately the beneficiaries of programs um, and the duty bearers, so government uh, authorities, uh, decision makers, um, because without bringing these two extremes together, it's extremely difficult to achieve impact. So it's about demonstrating an understanding of how your project contributes to the development of the capacities of rights holders to claim their rights and duty bearers to meet their obligations. I'm just going to, uh, no, I'm, not. I'm just going to drop out of this for a moment to see if um, there's anything, there are any questions that anybody has. Uh, I can do that. I can't do that. I think I have to stop sharing to do that, right? Uh, okay, that's good. Well, there's, uh, there don't appear to be any questions at the moment, but I think if you do have questions based on um, anything I say, uh, feel free to, 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 to write them up. I and mean, we, we, What I'll do is at, a, at the next juncture, I'll um, open up the webinar to a, a wider discussion, but um, uh, questions by text message are very welcome as well. I mentioned earlier the cross-cutting elements. Uh, there again, they're in the documentation. Uh, and I think that uh, it, they feed into what I've just been discussing, what I've just been describing in terms of the rights-based approach. It's about 
considering the interests of multiple stakeholder groups or identity groups and ensuring that they are reflected as far as possible in your project proposals. Increasingly, the, uh, the EU is uh, interested or committed to the principle of do no harm, which many of you will be familiar with. And in that definition below, I would draw your attention to the final comment, ensuring that uh, interventions uh, do not weaken rather than strengthen uh, the state as a site of decision making and policy formation over the de deployment of public resources. So again, it's about ensuring this inclusion, about ensuring that duty bearers rise to their responsibilities uh, and ensuring that projects are not simply one-sided, uh, that it's about, you know, that they, that they become um, a, a focus on battering down the doors of government rather than uh, reminding government that it has a responsibility to the government. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pause to see if anyone would like to just raise any questions about the general principles of EU funding or EIDHR funding before going into the specifics of uh, lot three. Michael, I haven't seen any uh, actual questions yet. If anybody would like to just, rather than write it down, just let us uh, know. You can also raise your hand um, by clicking on the, I think it's the question and answer <laughs> um, icon down at the bottom. No pressure. <laughs> it's no pressure, actually, because I would rather uh, get on to the uh, to, to, to the lot and talk about that because I, I would imagine that's your main area of interest is gaining a better understanding of what kind of proposal to put forward uh, for this particular opportunity. Um, so we can uh, we can get back to that. Um, you'll have read the <laughs> the, the, the the terms of reference. Um, Lot three is the one that's most conducive to media development work. Uh, and uh, the formulation is of the um, key objective is supporting uh, civic activism and participation by levering, leveraging digital, digital technologies. Um, under that kind of wider goal, it has three uh, objectives, which I'm not going to read out, but broadly speaking, uh, focus on countering hate speech, countering disinformation and advocating for accountability. What I'd like to do now is to look at those different objectives and consider some of the challenges involved, but also some of the opportunities they offer. Uh, and perhaps we could pause after each uh, objective uh, and open that up for questions if you have any, um, because this is what's key to presenting a successful bid for this particular program is understanding what the focus of the objective um, is uh, and what kind of idea the EU is likely to find attractive uh, in that context. A few general remarks about lot three. Uh, it's the smallest of the three lots, so the total amount of money available is five million, but it does have the highest funding floor and ceiling, so you can apply for between one million and two point five million uh, within the w w within the lot. Uh, it means probably that they're going to be offering uh, between three and five uh, grants within this lot. The minimum co-funding requirement is low, and so that's an attractive aspect of it, although 5% of 1 million is still a significant amount of money. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, there is an opportunity to argue the case for 100% funding if you feel that the chances of um, securing the shortfall of 5% are very small. I think this is about... Um, presenting media development ideas 
against the backdrop of what the EU and increasingly many donors feel media development to mean today. And as I said, I've been working in this sector for 20 years, and I think that the understanding of what the media can do and what media development can achieve in, in and transitional democracy, democracies has changed uh, considerably. There's certainly been a high degree of disenchantment with uh, progress in the media sector, despite the large amount of, uh, of investment. Uh, and many donors, including the EU, in my view, don't feel that the media or the independent media is capable of making real impact uh, on society and on social issues without the participation of uh, civil society. So I very much view this lot uh, as an effort to facilitate this nexus of media and civil society, which I believe is fundamental to the um, EU's belief system. Under objective one, uh, we can draw from the terms of reference a number of activity strands that clearly are appropriate uh, and of interest to the EU in this context. So under objective one, which talks about freedom of expression and countering hate speech, uh, it seems to me that the uh, Commission um, are looking for activities around research and monitoring. Uh, they're looking for uh, uh, projects which help to deliver an effective counter-narrative, particularly to hate speech. Uh, and the third area is around uh, transparency on how hate speech and other forms of intolerance are addressed online. The challenges around objective one, in my opinion, um, firstly, the sheer scale of the problem. The uh, amount of uh, racist uh, rhetoric, uh, discriminatory narrative that can be found online is almost limitless. <laughs> uh, the social media landscape itself is an ideal breeding ground for uh, hate speech, uh, for any kind of um, agenda-driven content. But conversely, I find it less conducive to the effective dissemination of counter-narratives. Um, and the reason for that is very much around the um, tastes and habits of uh, social media consumers. Hate speech by its nature is emotional, it's bombastic, it, it rides roughshod over the facts, it promotes an agenda, it promotes uh, a, 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 an easy to understand set of views and values. On the other hand, the counter narrative, which tries to challenge those ideas or debunk uh, the disinformation that's being uh, proliferated. That has many more subtleties uh, and therefore is harder to promote uh, and to disseminate using social media. Uh, hate speech relies on echo chambers. Uh, a more measured and balanced uh, narrative finds it difficult to reach multiple echo chambers uh, and even harder to draw people out of those echo chambers. So um, there, is, there are significant challenges around um, countering hate speech online. As we know, audiences are very accepting of what they read, uh, particularly if they receive that information for what, from what they would consider to be trusted sources. Uh, the response from the international development community over the past few years has been to focus on media literacy, to look at uh, giving audiences a better understanding uh, of what media agendas are and how to differentiate between independent media and um, agenda-driven media. In my view, and the EU is a case in point, there's been a lot of disenchantment around these programs because media literacy is such a long burn. Uh, it's something that can that relies on the complicity of multiple stakeholders. Uh, in the case of uh, media literacy, 
for uh, education for the education sector it relies on ministries of education on national curricula it's extremely difficult to negotiate and to get off the ground so working with media literacy i think is challenging and i think that donors have seen too many media literacy projects that haven't achieved what they set out to achieve um, there's a lot of work being done with hate speech uh, it's uh, been the cause celebre for the last few years so there have been multiple networks that have been developed probably dozens of different guidelines that have been published uh, there have been um, many many attempts to uh, rationalize this this sector so when looking at any project that uh, addresses hate speech i think it's incredibly important to understand what else has been done in uh, the given country what's worked and what hasn't and i think you need to demonstrate that uh, in the proposals the final remark about the challenges uh, is that and I, uh, and I will reiterate this several times this is a this is this program is about using t uh, t technology it's about uh, identifying technical solutions and the terms of reference underline that they should be open source so it's about creating uh, a, a, a set of tools for addressing these problems uh, and being able to hand those tools over to local stakeholders when the project comes to an end so the sustainability aspect of the technical solutions is very important and as you'll appreciate the eu like many donors has been disappointed in the past by its investment in technology uh, and then the inability of that technology to remain uh, available after grant funding comes to an end the opportunities that i see under objective one um, are around building on what's already been done in this field uh, and the EU certainly feels that it has uh, created many systems and ideas and uh, a community of best practice around uh, countering hate speech. I think to put it forward a successful bid for lot three you would at the very least need to reference those previous efforts uh, and EU guidelines and approaches uh, related to hate speech uh, to build on what they feel to have been the, the achievements uh, of those programs. The areas in which I feel that, um, that hate speech uh, has been um, addressed in the past and probably should continue to be addressed is around using technologies to um, identify categorize and classify uh, the, the sources of hate speech, if you like, um, to help develop strategy for countering hate speech by improving an understanding of where hate speech exists, how it's being proliferated, and what um, approaches are being used to reach vulnerable audiences. So certainly any project that looked at using technology to assess those issues um, and to provide greater intelligence and information into those issues would be warmly received. In order to make uh, that investment in technology, research and monitoring worthwhile, the next step would clearly be to look at ways of providing a counter-narrative, of addressing um, hate speech uh, from uh, the perspective of objective, um, editorially credible media uh, and civil society operators. Uh, the, the, the difficulty there, of course, is how to address issues around hate speech online without placing undue restrictions on freedom of expression. So in the context of this lot, that case would need to be argued how um, one could enter this space, the online space, um, provide that counter narrative uh, using freedom of expression as the, the rationale uh, or the driver for it, rather than, if you like, uh, the, um, the, an obstacle. Um, 
developing the narratives which act as a credible counterbalance to extremist rhetoric uh, goes back to what I was saying before about tone and style. This for me is about finding uh, a new voice whereby civil society, uh, online activists, uh, the general public can be uh, addressed, that their, their efforts can be mobilized in order to counter the perpetrators of hate speech. Uh, and this is an area which I think the EU finds extremely appealing. Uh, using civil society networks that do exist, but also drawing upon independent voices within the online media space to pull together a credible and coherent response to, uh, to hate speech. So I think any project that looks on sort of drawing on those uh, existing resources uh, without creating necessarily new ones uh, is going to be uh, of considerable interest. They talk about expanding the civic space um, this is an area, again, which I think um, is very core to the EU's agenda. They're looking to give civil society a new raison d'etre. They're saying that civil society hasn't been able to achieve everything it should be able to achieve because it's been restricted in certain ways. And one way in which certainly the EU feels civil society has been restricted is in getting its message out to the wider population representing the interests of its constituents, of its beneficiaries. So supporting civil society in reaching mainstream audiences is, in my opinion, of very significant appeal. Uh, and I think it's achievable also. I think that uh, civil society have a story to tell. Being able to help them tell that story uh, and doing it in a creative uh, and compelling way is certainly a very powerful uh, tool, a powerful weapon uh, in efforts to, uh, to counter hate speech. And that can be done you know, on, a, on a grassroots level, it can be done on, on, on a national level, uh, and certainly um, the, the, the Commission is interested in using uh, small grant schemes to give uh, organizations that are outside the, the consortium put together for these bids uh, in order to um, build that momentum, in order to be able to fund um, grassroots initiatives that have uh, a very clear focus, uh, that have a very clear audience, um, and that can use the funding to, um, to gain critical mass. So th those are my remarks on what I think could or couldn't work within, um, within objective one. Um, does anyone have any, any, any comments or remarks you know, in relation to that that you would like to share? I think that what, one question that came through by email was around um, the target groups for, uh, for this program. Uh, and it was suggested that the only target groups that are sort of uh, defined within the terms of reference are um, women, rural populations, marginalized groups, you know, are these the only uh, potential audience or are these the end beneficiaries for this program? I think the answer to that is no. I think that these programs should be um, addressing as broad an audience as possible. Uh, they should be looking to uh, engage uh, wider society in a debate about uh, these issues uh, and to try to uh, to give a voice to individuals or groups that don't normally have a voice. So uh, within this understanding of a rights-based approach and of sort of wider inclusion, uh, it's important it seems to me to uh, offer those opportunities as widely as possible. If you, if you want to say anything, um, then if you could uh, click the, the, the raise hand button and then we can give you the microphone. If not, I'm happy to, um, to move on. Michael, could I ask, um, I just, I've been wondering while you've been speaking about this, uh, when, when I first started with GFMD, there was a lot of focus on, uh, on the CVEs, the countering violent extremism. Um, um, 
sec uh, well yeah the, the the organization that we're working with this the stratcoms are they the competition in in, in all of this who are we uh who are we within the media development sector up against when we're when we apply for this kind of uh, funding? I think, generally speaking, Stratcom's agencies, and if anyone's not familiar with uh, with the idea of strategic communications, it's uh, it's a step away, if you like, from from, from independent media. It's about uh, having an agenda. It's about helping stakeholders to develop communications that have a specific agenda, and that could be promoting the government's policy, it could be tackling extremism, uh, it could be a wide range of different things, but it's not media per se because it's not about the provision of objective information. It's about using uh, communications to, to, to tackle a specific issue. Um, generally speaking, they don't apply for these programs. Uh, many of them are commercial organizations for a start and therefore can't. Um, the ones that aren't, this isn't necessarily their field. Uh, I think that the, the, the competition, if you like, for, for, for media development agencies is probably big uh, international civil society organizations that have a specific uh, uh, focus area, be it transparency, uh, or, or be it uh, promoting the rights of specific um, identity groups. Uh, I think I, in an ideal world, um, agencies that focus on media development should be looking to partner with traditional civil society organizations in the context of this program. Because I think you need, I think the EU is really looking for those two uh, groups to be brought together um, to, to find a way of um, uh, of orchestrating a kind of harmonious <laughs> collaboration between media and civil society, as I as I said earlier. And there's a term that's used very much in donor circles these days, which is infomediary. Uh, the idea that um, you don't need to be a professional journalist in order to be able to provide to access uh, information and provide information to a wider audience. Uh, it brings civil society kind of into the media sector uh, and, and it says to um, civil society activists, um, we're relying on you to access the, the groups and the individuals uh, that the media currently are not addressing. So it's what I was saying earlier, there's a sense of disenchantment in what the media can achieve and a, an increasing reliance on civil society to bring those lost voices into the um, public arena and into the public discourse. And again, I think this is something that um, the, the, the Commission will be looking for here, is uh, how you can build that bridge, how you can capitalize on what uh, civil society has to offer while still benefiting from the outreach uh, of, of media organizations. Because clearly, for all their virtues, civil society organizations don't have that outreach. They don't have the professional abilities to present information uh, in an accessible way very often. Uh, and they certainly don't have the platforms beyond social media to reach the kind of audiences that they would like to reach. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll, I'll crack on. Um, I wanted to look, I'm aware that time is passing as well, so I wanted to look at the, uh, the, the second objective because I think, again, this is an area in which um, there is increasing interest and yet um, a, a lack of perhaps focus and direction on the part of both donors and implementing organizations. So we're talking here about counter and disinformation. Uh, we're talking about uh, access to information for ordinary citizens on public issues. And again, from the terms of reference, there's three kind of activity strands which uh, are clearly appropriate to this area. So this is the research you're monitoring again, there's the idea of developing counter narratives, and there's responding, finding ways of responding to the proliferation of disinformation. 
it's not just the Russians who are responsible for disinformation. I think we would all agree that uh, many governments have been investing in disinformation for decades. Uh, it's become, if you like, uh, it's become a science now. And the Russians are certainly the leaders in um, fine tuning, shaping and modeling um, that particular uh, area of endeavor. Uh, the main challenges around counter countering disinformation from the perspective of both uh, civil society and media uh, are first and foremost that those who are spreading disinformation and creating disinformation uh, have no um, re have no ethical value. So that they're not that there's nothing that stops them saying what they want, where they want, and when they want. Uh, and obviously that's something that restricts uh, the professional media and responding. Um, they're not even necessarily promoting one particular viewpoint uh, where the aim is to sow the confusion and dissent, uh, where the aim is to exploit existing fault lines in local societies. It can be a, about multiple narratives and therefore it becomes even more difficult to uh, address them through a, a, a coherent and focus media intervention. Like hate speech, the tone, style, and messaging of uh, the architects of this information, as I like to call them, uh, is perfectly adapted for social media. So it's about bite sized um, sound bites, uh, it's about uh, sensationalist uh, one off remarks or headlines uh, that are very swiftly disseminated, that um, act as clickbait to um, perhaps more in-depth um, discussion, which is as misleading or as unrepresentative uh, as the remarks that, uh, that brought you there. So uh, we're talking about very superficial content uh, that is uh, eagerly consumed by individuals who are not necessarily interested in getting deep into issues uh, and uh, and are themselves you know uh, existing and operating within a, a social group or an echo chamber uh, whereby those uh, those those ideas or those messages are eagerly uh, accessed uh, and, uh, and shared. So this is uh, this situation is certainly in many countries uh, exacerbated by the fact that public support for uh, state media or independent media for any media uh, or indeed even free speech is weak. Um, in many countries there is a view that stability and security are more important than freedom of expression uh, and therefore they're looking or individuals are looking for messages that uh, that respond to uh, those emotional stimuli more than uh, a desire to have um, a, a, an objective or informed view about certain issues um, so clearly this raises the bar very high for, um, for, for media and for professional journalists. Um, one of the challenges certainly of um, anything to do with countering disinformation is how to reach those groups who are most affected by it, simply because uh, those groups are often quite resistant uh, to uh, the counter-narrative. Um, uh, for the reasons that I just explained um, in the case of uh, some populations because they don't necessarily have access to the counter narrative but uh, I think the projects you know within presented within this lot need to present a compelling argument for how they're going to reach uh, the groups that are most affected by uh, disinformation uh, and we'll talk in a moment about uh, fact checking. Fact checking has been the, uh, the the answer to disinformation for the last couple of years. You know, this is what uh, donors should be investing in: is ensuring that, uh, is supporting organisations in uh, verifying facts, in debunking myths, uh, in 
disproving the claims made by the architects of, of disinformation. I think the problem with that is that uh, whilst it's a very worthy endeavor, it doesn't necessarily reach those people. It doesn't necessarily resonate with those people. It doesn't necessarily resonate with the groups that are most vulnerable to the disinformation in the first place. Um, so we as the media development community need to come up, in my opinion, with better ideas of how to appeal to uh, the same groups that are currently finding disinformation more appealing uh, than professional media content. As I said, part of this is about um, understanding what makes audiences tick online, what audiences respond positively to, the kind of messages that they consume without question, if you like. Um, so in terms of the opportunities under objective two, I think that there is a lot of room still for using technology to uh, monitor and research disinformation campaigns to better understand what the trends and tactics and tools being used by uh, propagandists might be, uh, and then to find ways of uh, addressing them. So yes, you know, build by all means on fact-checking initiatives, but be aware that they have, uh, they have significant disadvantages in terms of their ability to appeal to, uh, to vulnerable groups. Uh, I think many initiatives around disinformation end up by preaching to the converted. Uh, and that's not necessarily because what they're saying is, I mean, it's definitely not because what they're saying is not of value. It's because it's not always being presented in a way that is appealing to the people most directly affected by the disinformation in the first place. I do think that there is a role here for um, bringing together civil society and media again. I think that civil society do have access to information that the media uh, do not necessarily have the resources or skills to access. Uh, civil society are very often much closer to vulnerable groups than journalists are. Journalists can benefit enormously from closer relationships with civil society in order to better represent the voices of those vulnerable groups. So in the context of this lot, I think that the EU would find that kind of approach appealing, that you would use effectively civil society as frontline information gatherers, but use professional media as a way of ensuring that that information reaches um, a broader audience. This is a way also of developing networks that allow for rapid verification. Um, again, one of the weak, um, one of the weaknesses of uh, current fact-checking initiatives is that they tend to be very late. So it, it takes a long time to investigate the uh, claims being made by uh, agenda-driven individuals or governments. By the time the real information services very often the news, the news agenda has moved on and there's, there is limited interest in the, the, the facts that are presented, even if they're more compelling than the original narrative. Um, so it's important, I think, to, 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 to move quicker in response uh, and to present a more compelling uh, uh, narrative um, to counter the disinformation that was uh, disseminated in the first place. I think what, what, what um, propagandists or what uh, the sources of disinformation are often unable to do is to uh, take a hyperlocal approach, uh, to present information that is of direct interest to vulnerable populations. And, um, and this is again an area in which both media and civil society can steal the march on um, the, the propagandists. Uh, so using um, very specific local issues of direct interest to local people as a way of disproving claims often made nationally or regionally by, um, by the architects of this information, this is, I think, a viable approach and one that the EU would find appealing. 
uh, in the same way programming formats that work, um, programming formats that uh, young people, uh, women, rural populations find appealing, uh, using humor and satire, uh, using um, a, a more um, collaboratory, uh, collaboratory and uh, participatory approach to addressing the issues that uh, are central to disinformation, these can be effective. So it's important in my view in any media development project that addresses this information to look at unlocking that creativity and coming up with new ideas that work. Because again, as I said before, countering um, kind of bombastic and emotionally appealing content with dry facts very often doesn't work, despite the fact that those facts you know, are, the, are the correct facts, that this is the real situation. Uh, the real situation is not necessarily uh, in that form uh, what, uh, what people are searching for uh, as an alternative. Uh, so it's about coming up with um, a way of setting the agenda of not simply responding to disinformation, of it not becoming a tit for tat exercise whereby uh, you know, we as a project are saying this, and uh, and that disproves uh, the information that was uh, disseminated by the propagandists. Uh, we're coming in it, as I say, very often too late. Whilst it will be far more in the interests uh, of audiences and populations in general to be setting the media agenda, to be. Um, to be heading off the uh, the propagandists of the past. Okay, well, I mean, as we're uh, running short of time, I'll, I'll just uh, present my comments on the uh, on the final objective. I mean, I do hope you don't feel I'm being too kind of didactic uh, or prescriptive about how to approach this lot. Um, as I said at the beginning, these are simply my ideas or my response to. The terms of reference based on the experience I've had of working in this sector. Uh, there are many ways of, uh, of skinning a cat, as they say, there are many ways of, uh, of approaching these challenges uh, and in any given country uh, some will be more effective than others. Um, so I, I'm by no means saying that uh, the proposals I'm coming up with are the only ones that will work. Uh, I think these are ones that the, uh, the Commission will find appealing and I think the ones that, um, that do uh, overlap or do reflect that the, the, uh, the priorities and interests that the Commission has at the current time and indeed of the EIDHR programme in general. So going back to... Uh, Going back to the presentation, oh, yes, uh, the, the final objective is around um, advocating for accountability. And these are, uh, are very familiar concepts to anyone who's worked in the media development sector. Uh, this is about civic engagement. Uh, it's about accountability. It's about the implementation of policy uh, and, uh, and the uh, contribution to the fight against corruption or, or abuse of power. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities within this objective to put forward a very wide range of uh, programs, uh, many of which uh, your organizations will have delivered in the past uh, and will be relevant to this particular bid. So I will present the challenges that I see more in the form of questions than in the form of answers. Uh, it seems to me that so much of this is about public service media. Uh, so much of this is about um, public service content that currently doesn't get into the public domain. Uh, in many countries, as I'm sure you'll agree, public service broadcasters have 
being discredited. Uh, they found it difficult to shake free of political influence. They found it difficult to develop programming that appeals to um, the mainstream audience. Uh, and often that is because uh, they view public service programming as worthy but dull. They, 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 they don't feel that uh, the public service programming is competitive uh, and they're working in a competitive environment. So often public service messages get lost. Uh, and I think again that the, the EU, the European Commission, feels this and feels there has been some uh, lack of progress in developing public service broadcasting and therefore perhaps again there is an opportunity for civil society to get more deeply involved uh, and to work with the media around information provision. So here uh, technology perhaps has not been exploited as much as it should have been uh, and uh, sustainable approaches have um, only, in my opinion, been developed on a limited basis. Uh, I think it's true to say that public service broadcasters themselves have made poor use of web-based technology, uh, and the information that people are most interested in is perhaps not central to their agenda. So when I look at opportunities within this um, objective, I think it's all about finding innovative ways of leveraging technology to reach those audiences um, on a rolling basis uh, to be able to establish uh, the, the, the link between um, what the government says and what the government does because the problem with media worldwide is that it responds to the next big story. Uh, there's a lack perhaps of continuity around media coverage. Uh, there's a lack of um, follow-up. And I think what technology can do is monitor ongoing stories in a more effective way to improve uh, and to facilitate a flow of information from what I would describe as frontline activists, so this could be again civil society, to mainstream audiences, um, finding ways of uh, checking on the progress of kind of grassroots initiatives or the implementation of government policy uh, and bringing that back to, uh, to, to the wider audience. Uh, again, as I said earlier, this is also about themes that will capture the audience's interest. Uh, it's about the themes that are close to their hearts uh, rather than broad political themes which many people find very distant from their lives. So to look at how the government, for example, is delivering on employment, uh, to look at uh, how the private sector uh, is respecting its commitments to the environment, uh, you know, these are areas in which I think there is opportunity within this program to deliver some um, highly impactful projects. And clearly investigative journalism is central to this. Um, the need to uh, work over a much longer term, to, to follow up on stories, to uh, monitor the progress of stories, to work across borders rather than simply um, in, a, in one country. Uh, I think investigative journalism on a sort of longer term technology based level is going to be very appealing uh, to the Commission under this objective. Uh, and finally, the creation of platforms that can improve open governance and, and, and introduce feedback mechanisms um, using technology to uh, assess uh, local views of government policy uh, and the implementation of government policy uh, to, to, to use grassroots platforms to, to create that feedback loop. Uh, and this of course doesn't always happen because um, the, 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 the information flow, if you like, from kind of national level to local level is often poor. Uh, and the ability to, uh, to follow up on 
issues which are only of limited local interest uh, is not necessarily supported by any one stakeholder. So here, uh, I think there is opportunity to, um, to, to, to create those platforms, to use mobile technologies, to use social media uh, in order to, uh, to, to improve that flow. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example of a project that I think will work very well uh, under Objective 3, which I developed a few years ago. It was um, equipping uh, Inuit populations in the Arctic Circle of Russia with the skills and technology to um, assess the extent to which um, the exploitation of natural resources was uh, properly reflecting government commitments around uh, the ecology and the environment uh, and reporting back from the front line of climate change, if you like, um, around the impact that uh, an abuse of uh, those rules and an abuse of power was having you know, on this critical part of our planet. So you've, this illustrates what I've been saying about this kind of flow of information from people who are close to these issues uh, in remote and hard to reach places and ensuring that information comes back to uh, a, a mainstream audience, but also empowers um, local people to, uh, to make informed decisions. So this um, ability of media, social media and civil society to provide a sustained and, uh, um, package um, and a coherent response is, I think, extremely important and very relevant under this objective. So that is it. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm sorry that, uh, that my remarks haven't engaged um, uh, the debate that we had hoped for, but I do appreciate that it's very difficult using this medium. Um, I see that there is uh, a question from um, Karin, uh, which reads, which I think you must all be able to see now. Uh, about whether the EU has been open and eager to support media projects, but the impact of these projects has been disappointing to them. I mean, again, I'd be very happy if anyone else would express an opinion on that, but uh, it's certainly my view that the all donors, not just the EU, uh, have lacked patience uh, when it comes to media. Uh, they've, had, they've lacked an understanding of how long it takes to deliver real change. Um, and I think part of that problem has been um, agencies um, over-promising and under-delivering, under um, coming up with projects that have very, very ambitious goals and haven't been able to achieve as much as they hope to achieve within that time frame. Uh, so for me, uh, if I had to give you advice about how to take that into account, I would say it's about being more realistic. It's about saying, uh, you know, we have, I think, within this program up to three years to make a difference. So let's make a difference that um, that that we know we can achieve within that uh, within that time frame, and that might mean lowering your ambitions. It might mean not trying to deliver change on a national level, but on a very local level. Uh, it certainly means being honest about you know what 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 can realistically be achieved um, but donors have always been <laughs> um, overly impatient when it comes to um, to delivering impact um, they everyone is accountable to someone and uh, donors need to be able to report internally that each project has uh, achieved you know ambitious goals uh, and when it doesn't they just kind of move on <laughs> uh, so like I say for me it's about uh, ensuring that the the logical seek the logical flow between uh, your activities your anticipated results uh, and your objectives are, are realistic even if on paper, your project doesn't seem to be as dramatic and sensational as you would like it to be. Uh, it's about setting realistic ideas. 
uh, and not raising expectations too high. Is there anybody else who would like, okay, we've got a comment here from Gabrielle. Yeah. yeah, I think that the, this issue of working in more than one country is an interesting one for the EIDHR because it's, again, one of the programs where you do have that opportunity. Uh, and I personally see that there is an advantage in um, working across borders in order to um, share experience uh, and, and indeed information, different ways of doing things. The Commission definitely likes projects where uh, there is an ability, which offer an ability to um, learn from mistakes and learn from achievements um, in comparable environments. Um, so if it's natural for your project to do that, and if your project can naturally achieve that, then I think it's definitely worth doing. What's not worth doing is artificially bringing two countries together, which uh, have little in common or have few shared interests, um, because you know you feel it's more competitive uh, to do so. So. I think in the field of investigative journalism, um, for example, there is huge added value in working in more than one country if it means that you can use uh, organizations or stakeholders in those countries to better share information or to um, implement investigations that, um, that cover you know, a region rather than one, um, one target country. Is there anybody who would like to share their own experiences of uh, applying for these kind of funds? If you just raise your hand, I can open the mic. It would be interesting to hear uh, because I know most of the people in this group, they're all part of the GFMD family. Many of you have actually acquired funding and I'm sure you've also sent in a lot of applications that haven't been accepted. So it would be interesting to hear your experiences or even to hear yours, Michael, were there some of the ones that you sent in that were not accepted and, and where you've had, where you've reflected on what, what was wrong in the proposal? Um, yeah, I, I have to say that um, I, I have a very high success rate with concept notes. I think, you know, that it's, it, it's easy to put in a, a strong concept note, you know, as I say, if you respond very clearly to the priorities of the program. It's in the ap full application stage that uh, they really start you know, making decisions I mean, because of the, li the limited funding, they obviously have to narrow it down. But uh, that's where um, you have greater latitude for, uh, for, for, for making mistakes, if you like, or for making your proposal less competitive. I don't find the... Um, European Commission's uh, evaluation process particularly transparent. Uh, as you know, they use a matrix which is in the terms of reference to score bids. And from the scoring that I've seen when I compare two bids, you know, that I, that I have knowledge of, uh, leads me to believe that uh, the marking is relatively arbitrary. I mean, if they're looking to choose between two bids of you know, that are both equally interesting in many ways and have uh, certainly have um, equally strong uh, propositions, uh, they'll make a choice between one or the other probably based on where it is or who's delivering it and then simply use the scoring matrix to discount the other one. I mean, I, I, it sounds cynical, but I think that's often the way it works. Um, Certainly, you um, can sink a good bid by uh, putting in uh, too high a level of management costs. Uh, they will use the kind of overall percentages of how much you have dedicated to project management, and how much you have dedicated to activity in order to make a valued judgment on the cost effectiveness of your bid or the value for money of your bid. Um, a lot of bids get marked down because the applicants don't have um, relevant experience uh, in the area that they're, that they're bidding for. Uh, 
of course it's tempting to use these programs to get into something new or to uh, widen your professional horizons. But I think if you're going to do that, uh, it, you'd be well advised to bring in a partner that, um, that compensates, that provides the experience that you don't have, uh, particularly local partners in country. Um, very often the harshest scoring is related to the relevance of the project. Um, so the, what will certainly um, what will certainly raise question marks from the evaluators is any project that um, appears to be uh, an ongoing uh, activity that such and such an organization uh, wants to refund um, and is effectively pitching it to all donors, um, the commission included. Uh, so I find your comment, there's, I'm not reading out this question here, but you can all see it, uh, that the EU is interested in projects with high risk of being implemented in a restrictive setting. Very interesting that that's, that's actually not reflected in the guidelines. Um, I think that uh, maybe high risk is the, is the wrong expression. I, I think that they look, they're looking for projects that push back the boundaries. Uh, as I said just now, I don't think that they want to fund uh, initiatives that are doing more of the same. Uh, the Commission is traditionally risk averse, um, that's for sure, <laughs> um, and um, wants to, to, to manage those risks as closely as possible. But for me, there's many, many um, comments or allusions in the guidelines, particularly around the flexibility uh, for uh, eligibility uh, and for uh, working with uh, individuals or groups that are not necessarily formally um, uh, established that uh, suggest a, a willingness at least to, uh, to work more on the margins, um, to work uh, not despite government because that's absolutely not part of the rights-based approach but to um, to challenge government um, where it's felt that challenging the government will make the government more aware of its responsibilities um, to the electorate. Um, so I, I wouldn't say um, that the uh, EIDHR is uh, uh, you know is, is is kind of the EU's opportunity to to, to try anything. <laughs> uh the eu is probably the organization that least wants to to try anything but it's um but in restrictive environments for sure um, uh, the, the case study that i mentioned um uh, in Turkmenistan, the eu is actually the only funder that has supported media development in Turkmenistan, to my knowledge um on, on that kind of scale so um the, as I said, the results weren't uh, necessarily the results we were all looking for, but the fact that the, the Commission was willing to try and to um, persist uh, working in that kind of environment says to me that the EIDHR is, um, has an appetite for risk. 